everyone. Welcome on behalf of Sustainable Marin and all the sustainables. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Special thanks to all of you for coming. You may think that you've seen the big event for tonight, but the big event is still in, ahead of you, okay? And I know that no one in this room is going to give our moderator as hard a time as those candidates <laughs> gave Jim Lehrer. <laughs> Good, great. Well, before I get into my doleful spiel about what sustainability is, I would like to remind everyone that the Bay Area has two Major League Baseball teams, and they are both in the playoffs. So, now, why are we here? Sorry. First of all, I would like to make sure that, it, like to make sure that everyone has a program in this program, you will find the questions that will be asked of the candidates so you can follow along. And you will also see in this program the short biographical sketches that we have gleaned from their promotional material. This is not uh, editorial free. This is their own words about themselves. Please read it. On the back of your program, you're going to see the names of some of the people and organizations that made tonight possible, and I have to say a few words about them. But I have to put my glasses on, because I can't see anything without them. So, um, the Green Chamber of Commerce has been one of our program sponsors. The Climate Protection Campaign, represented here tonight by Ann Hancock. The Marin Grassroots, yay. Thank you so much. And Marin TV, who is here live streaming our event and will be broadcasting it later on on uh, public access television. Our community partners include 350SF Bay Area, the Equal Voice Leadership Academy, who helped us write the questions that you will hear the candidates respond to tonight. Marin Peace and Justice, yeah, we're here for that. Yay. Marin Peace and Justice Coalition. Very special guest tonight, and we're very excited to have with us students from the Marin School of Environmental Leadership. <laughs> who also collaborated with us in developing the questions that are going to be meaningful to them, their families, and our community. But thank you very much for being here. Pachamama Marin. <laughs> Resilient Neighborhoods, a program of Sustainable Marin. So, um, just a little bit of background on why we're doing this, because as sustainable folks, we look at what's going on in politics and we tear our hair out and say, you know, you get a politician up on stage and no matter what question you ask, you get the answer that they want you to give, that they want to give. And what we really wanted to do was to ask our, our, our candidates and our politicians to respond to what's important to us. We expect that uh, we will be able to get answers that are given through the filter of sustainability. Just a couple of, of uh, ideas about this. Seems to me we're living in a time that's a definition of unsustainable. The exhaustion of natural resources, classification and toxification of the oceans, which are the foundation of all life systems on Earth, greenhouse gases and global warming processes that are changing the climate of our planet, unfair labor practices, inability of many of us to find work, the deterioration of assets that we were counting on, vast disparity in the incomes and income growth of different segments of our country and our society. Costly and devastating health problems, closely linked to rage, <laughs> race, age, <laughs> education, <laughs> causing rage, and economic status. <coughs> Unequal educational opportunities that consign some of our people to futures 
that cannot realize their potential. An unstable system is one where we recognize that we can't keep going on like this indefinitely. So that is the approach that we bring to tonight. We're taking action at home. We're taking action in schools. Cool the earth. We're in School of Environmental Leadership in our churches, in our social networks. We're starting to hold hands and make changes in our communities. We're here tonight to show our candidates that we are also engaged in governance. We know that we need a policy and legislative fr framework that will shape taxes, carbon and otherwise, energy policy, healthcare, education, and the economy in ways that befit our state and our country. Government requires choices. We heard that tonight. That was one of the few true things I heard. We want our electeds to make every decision, cast every vote, speak every sound bite through the filter of sustainability. Tonight's a chance for us to find out a little bit about what these candidates think, what their principles are, what approach they'll take, what experiences and spirit will move them to make decisions on our behalf. We want to get them on record and we want to hold them accountable. We are the sustainables, and we are paying attention. Read your program, and I can't let the evening go on without thanking Bill Carney in the back of the room, President of Sustainable San Rafael, Lisa Max, Bob Stocker, Jim Garrity with CMCM. Thank you all for being here. Did I introduce myself? No. My name is Kiki Laporta. I'm president of Sustainable Marin. There was a bit of commotion at the beginning. And now I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing a colleague of mine from a long time ago. We were colleagues before we even knew each other. Ann Hancock is co-founder and executive director of the Climate Protection Campaign, which is a nationally known <coughs> campaign. An 11-year-old Sonoma County-based organization whose mission is to inspire, align, and mobilize action in response to the climate crisis. They partner with business, government, youth, and the broader community to advance practical, science-based solutions for significant greenhouse gas reductions. She's worked for more than 40 years in business, government, and community-based organizations. Her master's degree is in public health from UC Berkeley. Thank you, Anne, for being with us tonight. Good evening. How are you doing? Yeah. yeah. Great. It's pretty amazing that uh, you guys put this on. Thank you. We don't have anything like this in Sonoma County, so. You know, the rivalry between Marin and Sonoma continues. So uh, I'm happy to be here. Really honored to be your moderator tonight. And um, so we're gonna get started. Well, first with the assembly forum and then with the congressional forum. Each candidate uh, for this assembly forum has two minutes to speak to his, about his qualifications and motivations. Uh, then I will ask the prepared questions. They're printed in your program. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer the question. We'll alternate the response order between our candidates. Uh, then we'll take five questions from the audience, given that we have enough time, and follow the same format as with the previous questions. Uh, and then each candidate will give closing remarks. Kay is our timekeeper. And she and I are a team. And uh, I was watching the presidential debate, and I was hoping that uh, you would cooperate <laughs> more than those guys did. Respect the um, We request that all applause, uh, just like the audience in uh, Colorado, uh, be saved until the end of the program, and that you basically are silent without, you know, hisses or or anything like that. Just hold all of that out of respect for our candidates. Um, as Kiki mentioned, there's uh, bios in your program. 
So at this time, we welcome Assembly Candidates Michael Allen and Mark Levine. Now you can Uh, so let's begin with your opening statements, your qualifications and motivations for office. They did a coin toss, and that determined the order. Two minutes each, and uh, Michael Allen, will you start us off, please? Hello, can you hear me? Great. Yes, um, my name is Michael Allen. My, my background, and I'll be very short on this, uh, you can find out more about me on my website. Um, I'm, I was a registered nurse. I, I worked in intensive care at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. When I moved up here, I worked with the uh, developmentally disabled. Then I worked in the uh, crisis clinic for Sonoma County as a psychiatric nurse, which prepared for my, me for my work in the legislature. <laughs> uh, after that, um, I um, went to work um, uh, as an attorney. I, I attended night uh, law school for four years while I was, I was a psychiatric nurse. Uh, my first job was with the Sierra Club uh, on the Warm Springs Dam project, part of the defense team. Uh, after my, my year of working with the Sierra Club, uh, I was hired as a, a labor attorney representing the county employees. I became their staff attorney. I did that for two years, then I became the um, uh, executive director for the union, which became SEIU, and then um, I was ultimately the president of the labor council for the four counties, including Marin. Um, I've, I have, I've also worked as um, uh, staff for Senator Wiggins. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that I'm one of the uh, co-founders of Solar Sonoma. I'm proud that I was the first treasurer for the uh, Smart Train campaign. Uh, I'm very proud of my work uh, in social equity. I was one of the founding members of the Living Wage Coalition of Sonoma County. Uh, and I also have done work in uh, health care. I can't quite read that, but I think my time is up. Oh, okay. With, that, with the remaining 30 seconds, I would just say that my, my work in the legislature, uh, I've done uh, a tremendous amount of work uh, around the issue of um, mental health, keeping our, our state uh, hospitals to a level of care that our families deserve. Uh, I've also done a lot of work with the North Coast legislators, uh, Jared Huffman and others, uh, to struggle to keep our state uh, parks and open spaces uh, open to the public. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, to Sustainable Marin and, and Ann Hancock, thank you for moderating. I'm Mark Levine. A little bit about my background. Um, after I graduated from grad school, um, I developed software used to monitor human rights abuses around the world. And the partners that I had in that work, uh, my funders, were both George W. Bush's State Department and George Soros's Open Society Institute. <laughs> Two people who you know, have organizations that have cultures that follow those beliefs, um, but was, I was still able to work with them to bring them together on doing something good with technology in a way that would benefit society. And that informs my governing philosophy that what I was able to do with my work in public service internationally, locally. As I got married, I, I fell in love, wanted to focus closer to home. I also got caught up in the presidential election in 2008. Watching the debate tonight reminded me about how I was in Pennsylvania at this time, working for President Obama in, uh, in that election. And afterwards, I thought, we can continue being engaged in politics and public policy and the brand of politics that President Obama was bringing to our country that I felt that we could also bring some decisive leadership on the important issues facing us, like sustainability, here at home. And I came home, got involved in our local Democratic Party, and was elected to the uh, San Rafael City Council. In this election uh, for assembly, we have amazing opportunities to do good things in Sacramento, but when I speak to my neighbors, when I speak to my friends across the district, many people feel that Sacramento has not served us well, and that we do need change in the culture in Sacramento to make sure that our priorities are being heard and sustained, and people want to have a local voice. And so I decided to run in this campaign, although Sacramento asked me not to, because we do need to have a local voice that can represent us and knows our issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, our first question. Sustainability is about responsibility for the future, and we are pleased 
to have that perspective well represented here tonight with our 45 students from Terra Linda High School, the School of Environmental Leadership. They provided our first lead-off question. Here it is. What does the ideal sustainable society look like to you? What specific steps would you take in the California Assembly to achieve that society? Each candidate has two minutes to respond to the question. And Mark Levine, will you start us off on this one, please? Thank you. Well, there are, there are you know, some basic tenets of, of uh, an equitable society and sustainability that I I've, you know, believe are important to all of us that will build a just society. And that is equity in education, equity in, in for, for uh, also our environmental values, as well as economic equity, uh, which I think is very much tied in, as we were listening to the presidential debate, access to public health and health care. When I was in college, I was the chairman of the California State Student Association during an era that I describe as Pete Wilson austerity. It was a very difficult time in our state in the mid-90s. They were cutting budgets, cutting schools. Uh, but what I was able to do as an advocate for students was make sure that a third of all fee increases would go back to financial aid so that no one would be priced out of college, that if you qualified for the CSU or the UC or community college for that matter, that you were going to have uh, a pathway there, and that money was not going to be uh, an obstacle for that. In, uh, you know, the, the other areas that are so important to us is something that's informed my, my role as a city council member where we have done some amazing things with passing, for example, with, with the leadership of staff and community members who are here in this room, the, uh, some of the strictest green building ordinances in the country and the standards that people have to meet to be here. What that means is that we're not going to be releasing more and more greenhouse gas emissions uh, to do cooling or heating because our buildings are going to be that much better uh, and sustainable. Um, there are going to be so many other benefits as well uh, for us because of that work. But I think we also need to keep a, a keen eye both on the economic opportunities for, for all of us. We know that it, with a college degree, there's a 4% unemployment rate. Without one, it's over 10% in California but also how uh, California's Health Benefit Exchange uh, is created. Peter Lee is doing a fine job on that, but we need to make sure that ACA is implemented uh, well here in California. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Um, Mr. Allen, would you like me to repeat the question? Are you no, I have the question here in front of me. Thank you. Um, you know, first of all, thanks for the question. It's a great question. And to me... Um, Let's start with what the definition of sustainability is, the classical definition. Sustainability means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet those needs. And so when uh, the other part of the question is, what would the ideal sustainable uh, community look like and, or society look like? And to me, it's locally based that fills the needs of the local inhabitants while making sense for the total planet. And so, um, specifically, um, some of the things that I would like to work on uh, in the coming years uh, in the legislature is, number one, oversight. We, we've already adopted AB 32 and, and 375, but we need to work with the private sector, local government, NGOs, to uh, make it work. And so you can't adopt a law and then just walk away from it. You have to implement it, and you have to find out what are the barriers to implementation, how are we going to make it work for the local citizens. And that's where you and I come uh, into play, talking to one another about what works and what doesn't. I want to, uh, uh, personally, I don't believe in cap and trade. I support a carbon tax. But since we have cap and trade, um, I want the revenues to be invested in sustainable practices, things that will move us forward. And so there's going to be a huge fight over what happens with those revenues. I want them to see going to the best practices that take us toward a, a sustainable society. Um, I'm, I'm a supporter of net metering. I want to make sure that people get more and more of their money back if they adopt uh, solar energy practices for their homes and community. I'm a big fan of using gray water, best practices, so that we can, we can do irrigation and reuse our water so that there's enough water not only for this generation but future generations by best practices. Um, I'm also very cognizant of social equity. It's always been a big part of um, my um, belief system, so uh, I'm looking very forward to working on the health care exchanges and also being a co-author with Senator Leno on the uh, SB 810, which is uh, single-payer health care. Thank you. Our second question. At 
Acceptance scientific research tells us that we need to rapidly reduce carbon emissions to solve the climate crisis. Where is climate change on your priority list for California and why? What specific steps would you take in the state assembly to better address climate change? Mr. Allen, would you start us off, please? Sure. Um, the, in terms of my priorities, the way I put it down is, number one, my, my first priority is education. And why is it education? I, I believe unless we have a society that's capable of critical thinking and that has respect for science, we're not going to have the political will to actually do something about climate change. So education to me is incredibly important if we're going to have the political will to do anything regarding climate change. Uh, protecting our environment and biosphere is extremely important because it's the basis upon which our economy is based, not the opposite. And of course, part of that is then the tricky part is integrating that into the economy and jobs in such a way is that we're moving forward, creating jobs, but also not degrading the environment. And I believe we can do both. So f for some of the specifics, I think that besides gathering the data as to how uh, we are document documenting what are the climate changes here uh, locally, that we need to continue to increase um, uh, actions to reduce uh, GHG admissions. So, you know, some of the things that we would continue working on would be uh, uh, the, uh, the, the smart train, high-speed rail. Uh, we, we just recently passed legislation to double the efficiency for the California fleet, um, increase IT technology, use of video conferencing so people don't have to travel all over the state uh, uh, to get their work done. With housing and infrastructure, I'm a big fan of transit-oriented development, but in, in cooperation with our neighborhoods. With agriculture, I, I encourage dry farming and greater water conservation and uh, sustainable organic practices, less use of pesticides. With green energy uh, production, to me, um, we can produce a far more energy with wind and solar. And I'm also a big supporter of Prop 39, which would close a corporate tax loophole of $1 billion and devote $500 million of that toward green energy proje uh, pro uh, projects with the rest going to our general fund. So those are some of the specifics, and thank you. Yeah, I think that these are, th this is particularly s s with sustainability, but this question as well. What you see in this race is that we're, we're two Democrats, and, and there are certain values, particularly with the environment and sustainability, where we're going to have a lot in common. Um, I think the key issue for me is how do we approach these issues? How do we find common ground in Sacramento as well as with our constituents to advance uh, the values we have? And one of the key things that we need to do in Sacramento is be sure that we can fix the budget so that when we want to fund education, as it may be, uh, Prop 39 helps us if, if it's passed with a windfall to, to provide more environmental uh, infrastructure. Um, that voters trust Sacramento to do the right thing uh, and make decisions for the budget um, that will represent the values that voters have. When I'm speaking with voters and I ask them, how's Sacramento working for you? A lot of people say, well, Sacramento's not working too well. And when we're asking them to pass something as important as Prop 30, they, they say, well, you know, are, how are they going to spend the money? And so we need to rebuild that trust with the voters that has broken down. I know with sustainability, we've done an amazing job at the local level. We've taken AB 32, SB 375. We've done some great things um, locally. And we can take those lessons with us to Sacramento, the trust that people have in local government, and say, we, we've got these practices. We've learned these lessons. We can bring that to the capital. I mean, we had a $20 billion deficit last year, and we had legislators hiding their office budgets until a judge compelled them to open their budgets to, to public view. I don't think they were doing anything wrong. They just didn't want to show the public how they were spending their office budgets. As a leader in the assembly, I would say that's wrong. I would have opened my books immediately. We need to have that approach in Sacramento. Um, and so we need to build that trust that when we say we need to do something about sea level rise, that we're doing it responsibly, that we're bringing people into the decision making, and that we're having a, a, an approach that people can count on. Thank you. Third question. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce and others continue to say that job creation and environmental regulations are at odds, especially during these hard times. What would you do in the Assembly to achieve a thriving economy and a thriving environment? 
as a specific example, to what degree should California regulate hydraulic fracking for natural gas? So, uh, Mr. Levine, yeah. your call. Thank you very much, Anne. Well, I think with Prop 39 as an example, we can change the tax system for out-of-state companies, make it even with California companies, and then use that windfall, if, if you could call it that, um, in this budget climate to do things that are increasing sustainability for our state. And that's going to give people jobs. It's going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And it's, it's going to put California on the right path for where we need to be. But we need to use uh, greenhouse gas reduction as an economic innovator and engine in other parts of the state as well. We need to have a path forward economically. And I think that's the direction that we're going in, particularly with Prop 39, but we need to model other projects that way as well. I think like most people, I, I'm quite concerned with hydraulic fracking. I rented the documentary Gasland, and uh, my wife and I watched it, and we saw the water coming out of the faucet and light up on fire. And I think that gets a lot of people really concerned, and rightly so, uh, particularly with, with what's happening in the Northeast. I did a little bit of research about how that's impacted California. Fracking's been taking place in California for 50 years. I had no idea. And it's something that's a concern for me. There were a couple of bills that failed in the legislature this past year, uh, SB 1054, that was supposed to notify people if fracking was going to take place, uh, as well as AB 591, which was the disclosure of chemicals used in fracking. Um, we need to find common ground with the legislators who stopped that from passing. It's really important to build bridges with them. I think that finding where that common ground is here in the North Bay, for example, we have a lot more, for example, 25% of the Bay Area's dairy comes from agriculture, from West Marin, uh, comes from West Marin and, and Sonoma. And so we have an agriculture economy that we have in common with, say, redder parts of California. How do we build that common ground so that we can find it in places like the regulation of fracking and finding out what they're putting in the ground. Thank you. Yes, um, my, my name is Michael Allen, and I'll repeat. I spent 38 years working in Sonoma and Marin, two years now in Sacramento. So I am not Sacramento. My name is Michael Allen. And I think that should be made clear. Regarding the Chamber of Commerce comments, uh, you should know that, that – um, I'm endorsed by the Sierra Club, uh, the uh, uh, League of Conservation Voters. Uh, I'm a member of the Legislative uh, Environmental Caucus. Uh, frequently, the, the Chamber of Commerce tries to persuade us that we cannot have both a clean environment and a vibrant society. I do not endorse that view. I do not believe in that view. I believe we can chew gum and walk at the same time. I, I do believe that uh, we um, are quite capable of having a very healthy, vibrant economy and yet uh, not uh, tear apart our regulations. I'm very proud of the fact that I joined uh, Jared Huffman and other legislators in writing a letter at the closing of session to oppose the gutting of CEQA or the change of CEQA at, at the 12th hour. That is action. That is not rhetoric. Uh, regarding fracking, um, I uh, co-wrote a bill uh, with uh, Assembly Member Wykowski, which basically demanded full disclosure of what they were pumping into the ground, asking for transparency in fracking, and also joined the Environmental Caucus in telling Governor Brown that he needed to hire inspectors and start regulating it, and essentially either calling a moratorium on it or doing something other than just saying, we'll kind of let it go on for a while and then figure it out later. It's those kind of unsustainable practices which endanger the public, endanger our children, and are things that you want a legislator in Sacramento that's going to stand up on their hind legs and say, Governor, that's wrong. Thank you. Fourth question. Finding affordable housing, finding affordable housing is a persistent problem for many working people in Marin and Sonoma. In fact, the Department of Housing and Urban Development has found Marin's housing discriminatory. Still, loud voices are raised against more compact development. As our assemblyman, would you help further the state's sustainable community strategy in District 10? If yes, how? If not, why? How else would you approach equity issues in the district? Oh, I'm sorry, I did it wrong. Yeah. Mr. Allen, you're, you go first. 
Thank you. Um, I've been a longtime proponent and supporter of affordable housing. It's, uh, part of that is illustrated by my early advocacy for the, the Smart Train project. Uh, it's, no projects are perfect, but I do believe that if we value our open space, that we need to have a central spine for transportation. We need to find a way to make uh, our public transportation more robust so that basically people will use SMART, but also encourage people to live in, and work in close proximity rather than asking people to commute large distances uh, to uh, be able to afford their livelihood. So to me, uh, and, and this is a very important point, um, I, I actually I take it as a badge of honor that some of the uh, folks who talk about Agenda 21 as if it's some sort of sinister worldwide plot to get people to live more sustainably. I, I was identified as one of the major change agents that they needed to watch. And frankly, I, I, I do believe in change, but I, I believe what, what you do is you do that in cooperation with the citizens with, with great respect for neighborhoods, where you find ways to add value to neighborhoods, yet at the same time increase density and increase um, the ability to people to, to live and work in close proximity and enjoy life without having to commute large distances across the Bay Area. So I've, I've always been a strong proponent for affordable housing, for transit-oriented development, but never at the expense of, of overlooking or mistreating or being disrespect, disrespectful to neighborhoods. I believe you can do both. Thank you. Yeah, I think we can look at some local results that have been very positive. So for example, when I'm with my children on 4th Street in San Rafael on a Saturday morning and I see other people there, it's because we've got housing in and around that downtown area that adds to the economic vibrancy of our city. So we've been able to, and this is something that's happened over time, uh, but as we look at some of the planning in place to encourage that type of living near uh, downtowns or near transit, uh, as we rezoned uh, the Santa Rafael Corporate Center for BioMarin to be able to move there and do the work that they do, that we can have jobs and housing uh, close to transit and have it be a successful model. The most important thing is that we allow local jurisdictions to make their own decisions in doing that and to respect the neighborhood characteristics of all of our towns to make sure that we can do it in a way that the residents would like it to be. Um, it's difficult though. So as many of us know, um, redevelopment agencies have been dissolved. In San Rafael, all of our uh, affordable housing programs came out of redevelopment. Now, uh, because of AB 1484, which my opponent had voted for, our affordable housing staff now just file reports and make sure those reports get in on time because if they're not in on time, we get fined $10,000 a day and the state will take back, or pardon me, hold back rep sales tax revenue from our jurisdictions if we don't do it in time. The, the League of Cities is suing uh, against this, but this is a huge threat to our affordable housing program that we can't fund any longer and that our staff isn't able to push uh, as well. So, you know, we need to make sure that the state is not forcing mandates upon us as well as onerous uh, reporting restrictions that stop us from doing the good work that we've seen the positive impacts from on affordable housing and on planning for the future of our community. Marin has a wonderful history of conservation. I think people move here and stay here because of that culture that we have here of conservation, and we can continue to respect it and plan for a future as long as we're able to make those decisions locally. Thank you. Thank you. Fifth question. California seems to be in a perpetual state of deficit. What makes you the best qualified candidate to work with other legislators to achieve a sustainable budget? If you could, what spending would you cut? And if you could, what programs and revenues would you add? As an example, how would you pay for adapting to sea level rise and other climate impacts? That's a big question for two minutes. I am a supporter of Prop 30 for our budget to sustain the services that residents expect and need and make sure that we have the education programs in our state, uh, that, that we need to do something to make sure that the budget has those funds. However, we will probably, highly likely, have a $10 billion deficit for the next five years. And Prop 30 is not necessarily going to stop that for us. There are very difficult choices before us. I think dealing with the budget honestly with voters, but also with ourselves, is, is going to be a critical part of that, of gaining that trust. I mean, not only um, did, the, did the legislature hide their office budgets, you know, they, we passed Prop 25 in 2010 where 
We allowed them to pass a budget with just a majority. They passed a budget that was unbalanced. It was ridiculed up and down the state by editorial boards. The controller withheld their pay. Um, and then they sued to get their back pay back. I don't think that earned trust with voters on some of the difficult budget issues that we have. We need to have, uh, we, we can do better and be more honest about the work that we're doing. What would we cut? We're, we're, we've got two propositions on the ballot uh, to end the death penalty and reform three strikes. We need a lot of prison reform. We need a successful pathway for nonviolent offenders to be successful in life outside of prison so they're not recidivist, uh, recidivists so that we can save that money and use it in education so that other people can also have a successful pathway in life. We haven't been planning for that, and we can do a whole lot better there. Sea level rise is something that I've done a lot of studying recently as I was appointed to the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. And we're working with other regional agencies uh, in the Bay Area to develop a plan to address that issue. It's a big one, a really big challenge. There has been so much built in and around the Bay and BCDC has been very effective, actually, in the past 40 years in actually reclaiming more bay. The bay is larger today than it was before BCDC was formed. And that's an amazing thing. That wasn't sea level rise. That was actually good for the environment. Uh, but we have a lot of planning ahead of us as uh, those agencies work together. Thank you. As far as the best qualifications, all I can tell you, as I presently sit on the budget committee, and uh, we do wrestle with the budget. It's a very difficult situation. I can tell you that um, I was chosen to be on the conference committee for public pension reform, which was the most complex issue to deal with when you're juggling and trying to balance equity issues, trying to protect the right to people to have decent pensions versus trying to also find ways to save money so that we will have the money for services. Uh, we have just begun the process, uh, the, the first, uh, uh, part of our work, we, uh, depending on who you talk to, 50 to 70 million dollars will be sa billion dollars would be saved with PERS over the next 30 years. Another 16 to 20 billion dollars with the STIR system. Also more money with the 37 Retirement Act. Uh, if I'm elected, I, I'm going to be the chair of the pension committee, looking at further reforms, which would would help greatly. If I had a magic wand, what I would do is I would try to change our taxation system. We have, we have a progressive uh, tax system that basically uh, peaks when times are good and, and then plummets dramatically when times are bad. Uh, essentially, if we had some sort of uh, value-added tax system or a system that was based upon taxing services rather than just income, uh, there might be ways where we could avoid that. But that would take a, a huge amount of work and, and finding consensus within the legislature. I can tell you I do agree with my opponent regarding that we spend far too much for the incarceration of folks that shouldn't be incarcerated. I do support uh, the propositions that would amend three strikes and the death penalty. And uh, as far as revenue, I, I think that uh, the oil severance tax and VLF funds would be very helpful. In terms of sea level rise, all I would say to that is that um, I, I co-sponsored a bill that we did not make through that would actually have allowed us to measure scientifically what is the level of sea rise throughout California and start planning for it. And essentially, we could not get the consensus in the assembly to get that bill through. All right, now, thank you very much. Uh, we're on to the audience-generated questions. And I have to say, you have been submitting a lot of really great questions, and we don't have time for them. So I have two here. And we ask if you could to please keep your answers to one minute so that we can get to more questions. Uh, the first one is 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. 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 Uh, Marin's influence leads to a huge throwaway waste stream. Oh, Marin's affluence leads to a huge throwaway waste stream. Zero waste has had a snail's pace. Our landfill is filling up. What would you do to help get us to zero waste or close? Mr. Allen. Well, I, I think that the first thing that we could do is, um, you know, uh, there's a plastic bag ban that would be a good thing. Uh, there is um, the possibility of finding the best practices through the state. I know that some counties have actually uh, gone to 75% recovery of their waste. And so um, there's models out there already in California that would be very helpful. Also, my good friend and colleague, um, Assemblymember Chesbro, is considered one of the foremost experts in this area. 
and could help us greatly in terms of looking at what rent practices are and then finding remediation for them. So what, what I'm saying, it's not rocket science. Other, other jurisdictions have done it, and we could adopt those best practices. No, I think I got it. Um, yeah, we can do so much more in this, and, and absolutely banning plastic bags. Uh, we just banned polystyrene in San Rafael. It's just a tremendous accomplishment. I'm so proud of this. It's a long time coming, and, uh, and it's certainly a move to zero waste. We, we are at 75% in Marin. I think we can be proud of that, but we can be better. We're on the road to 84%, I think closer to 90% by uh, 2025. So we're getting there, but we need to make sure that we're eliminating things. Uh, another one that I'm, I'm proud of, uh, we just passed a very strict anti-smoking ordinance. Maybe we'll get some of those cigarette butts out of the waste stream at all that, that are just so poisonous, as well as just uh, the wrong model of behavior is I watch my children grow, and they're very curious, why, why are all these cigarette butts around uh, that we can do um, so much more on zero waste? We also need to work on, on post-consumer waste. Uh, as we're purchasing items from stores, can we purchase the items without so much packaging and, uh, and, and help to encourage the, the corporations that do that packaging to make it recyclable and to take it back? Level rise in the Bay Area has averaged two to three uh, millimeters per year for the last 150 years, with no recent acceleration. This translates to a can't read this word. Oh, can somebody help me out? Can't read this word. Level rise. Oh, there it is. Seven foot more or less uh, rise by the end of the century. This is hardly a crisis. Views, please. Would you like me to read that again? Sea level rise is hardly a crisis is the question. Yes. Why don't you read it again? Yeah. So, okay. Since yeah, sea level rise in the Bay Area <laughs> has averaged two to three millimeters per year for the last 150 years with no recent acceleration, this translates to uh, seven plus or minus uh, rise by the end of the century. This is hardly a crisis. Views, please. Yeah, we know in the 20th century that there was sea level rise, and it sh it's that in the 21st century that will continue. It's a certainty. We also see warning signs throughout the world uh, of uh, you know, glaciers melting, the ice caps melting at a greater clip, far more than they ever have in the past. We need to heed these warning signs that there is climate change. And the science, of course, is behind it. So we need to, to, to recognize this as probably one of the key issues uh, that we will all face into the future as we plan for um, you know, what California is going to look like. Of course, this is an issue that's going to face other people in a much more devastating way than even California. But the Bay Area, with all of uh, the water that surrounds us, is something that we must take seriously and certainly respect. Water is not something that we often can control. And, uh, and, and so we must take it seriously. Thank you. Yes, earlier I mentioned my respect for science-based data. T to me, um, I think there's been an acceleration of, uh, uh, of ice uh, melting. Uh, we're losing our, our, our polar ice caps. Um, I think that uh, essentially we do have to plan for, for, a, for a worst case and take, take a look at what we need to be doing five years out, 10 years out, 15 years out. I think it, it requires uh, private sector and public sector uh, cooperation. Uh, if, it, if it means that we have to uh, build dikes, if it means that we have to accelerate our efforts to uh, uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, we need to do that. We also know that we're not alone. We know that even if California made its best efforts, if Marin County made its best efforts, this has to be part of a planet-wide effort. But I do think that uh, what is important is for those areas of the world that can set a good example and establish best practices to do so, because this is going to require a, a planet-wide solution. So to me, uh, we, I would rather uh, plan for the worst-case contingency than just expect it to continue as it did uh, in the last century. Thank you. All right, uh, we're now ready for, I'm sorry to say, for all those good questions, uh, for the closing remarks. So you'll have two minutes each, and uh, Mr. Allen, you begin. 
what I'd like to say is that I do believe I, I am a local voice for uh, the constituents here. I'm very proud of the fact that I have the endorsement of the environmental community. Uh, Conservation Action in Sonoma County supports me, Sierra Club, the other organizations I mentioned. Um, very proud of the fact that um, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Jared Huffman, has endorsed me. Very proud of the fact that the five uh, uh, Marin County Board of Supervisors has endorsed me. I do believe that um, uh, part of representing folks is listening deeply and respectfully and then trying to figure out solutions to, together. Uh, in one or two minutes, uh, myself and Mr. Levine have been trying to give you like little squibs of information, but you know as well as I do, this takes deep, thoughtful uh, conversation and planning if uh, we're going to have a truly sustainable society, not just in Marin, in Sonoma County, but in California and for our nation and going forward. Uh, one thing I would say is I was a little bit distressed that tonight with the debates. I would hope they would get into the discussion of climate change because it is one of the major, major uh, uh, determinations as to uh, how it's going to affect our capacity to do things as a, as a society uh, and, and on a planet-wide basis as well. So it's probably uh, an incredibly important subject that uh, is – uh, and, I, and I would like to say I'm so grateful that you have this forum with this particular emphasis because um, it really allows us to focus on the fact that we have so many different problems, but some of the problems are, are um, uh, of a magnitude that affects all the other things that we're trying to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So sometimes it's good to look at the, at, the, at the small problems, but then you have to go back sometimes and look at the overall and then try to ask yourself how these things connect up so that you can address it in a, in a, in a comprehensive uh, fashion. Uh, and so I, I'm just very thankful to be here tonight, and thank you all. Yeah, thank you very much, Ann, and, and to Sustainable Marin for hosting this. I was called just over a year ago by the Speaker of the Assembly. He said to me, Mark, you deserve to be in the legislature, but it's not your time. Because of redistricting, we're going to move Michael Allen into the district, and uh, you know, we're going to back him. I was threatened with a million dollar campaign against me. That occurred, I was outspent five to one in the spring. I won in Marin, and we held my opponent to only 30% district wide. Money does talk a lot in politics. I don't think being outspent five to one is a, st a sustainable way to talk about politics, to talk about sustainability. But what I told the speaker was is that voters get a choice in this. They can choose from a local public servant who has served on a city council in the district, or on someone who's being foisted upon them with a million dollars of special interest money. Again, not something that has proven sustainable for the state of California to have special interest force politicians upon us. But it's powerful, and it talks to a lot of people. I am raising my family in this district. We have a beautiful, beautiful community. We have so much to work for in education, for the environment, for our economic vitality. This is something that I've had a conversation with, from, with people from Sausalito to Santa Rosa. Grateful to have the endorsements of mayors from Sausalito to Tiburon to Ross to, to Santa Rosa to Sonoma. And the San Francisco Chronicle, which just endorsed me on Monday. And I would encourage all of you to go online and read the Chronicle's endorsement of my candidacy and how they support my perspective that this top-down uh, policymaking from Sacramento hasn't served us well and that the baggage that my opponent carries with him to, to Marin is something that we should all be concerned about. We have so much to work for here, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to ask for your vote. Thank you.
He's there. He's coming. Please take your seats. Please take your seats. Short uh, biographical statements, once again, for the candidates are in your program. Uh, we'll begin with the candidates answering the questions shown in your program, as we did with our assembly candidates. Uh, then, instead of questions from the audience, because our congressional candidates want to handle questions in a more personal and informal manner, they've agreed to stay for 15 minutes at the end of the evening to talk to people individually. Um, and once again, we request, and you've been great, uh, to hold your uh, applause and save it till the end of the, pro uh, the forum that we have here. So um, they've also had a coin toss. And uh, we're going to start with the same question that we started with for our assembly candidates. But before we do that, let's give them a round of applause. to acknowledge uh, our uh, elected representative from San Rafael, Damon Connolly. I've had the pleasure, we've had the pleasure in Sonoma County uh, working with Damon on uh, Sonoma Clean Power. We uh, want to find out all that you've done with Marin Clean Energy and, uh, you know, see if we can improve on the model. Woohoo! So thank you, Marin, for going first. All right, so... Uh, our first question, uh, sustainability is about responsibility for the future. And uh, uh, if you weren't here earlier, uh, the students rep uh, recommended this question for you. The students from the School of Environmental Leadership at Terra Linda High. Here's the question. What does the ideal sustainable society look like to you? What specific steps would you take in the US Congress to achieve that society? And Jared Huffman, we will begin with you. Two minutes. Well, thank you, Anne. And thanks, everyone, for holding this forum. It's great to be with so many people who care about sustainability and also with young people that are thinking about their future and the future of our planet. It's a great opening question because it asks us to think big and uh, uh, almost to think uh, idealistically, almost utopian-like. Uh, what would my ideal sustainable society look like? Well. I would start with um, an energy system that was entirely clean, safe, and renewable. And the second part of your question for each of these things is what can the federal government do to make that happen? Well, the good news is California has shown the way, uh, and the federal government can adopt a lot of the successful models that we've done here in California, and I've had a chance to be part of those. We need a federal renewable portfolio standard. We need stronger efficiency and appliance standards. We can do all sorts of things and without even getting into greenhouse gas reduction, but that needs to be part of it uh, to help achieve that clean energy future and build a clean energy economy at the same time. Next, we need a transportation system that is multimodal, that doesn't force people to be dependent entirely on the automobile. Obviously, the federal government is a major funder of transportation. We can make sure that we have the incentives and the standards in place as we roll out transportation legislation to encourage the right kind of transportation solutions. Uh, we need local food and working landscapes that are sustainable. We can't afford to continue having all of our food grown far away uh, with standards that we don't always control or even know about. Uh, and we've done a lot of good leadership here in Marin County on that. That needs to begin to be part of the Farm Bill and other federal policies. We need product responsibility and stewardship. And the, your prior debaters were talking a little bit about this, a cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach. We need green chemistry legislation. I've helped do that at the state level. We need the federal government to step up and do that as well. And then finally, we need healthy habitats and ecosystems. If we're going to achieve this ideal of sustainability, uh, we've got to have not only environmental sustainability from our perspective, but the planet needs to be healthy. The animals and the ecosystems need to be healthy. We need to make sure we're always striking that balance. Thank you. And uh, Dan Roberts. Yes, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So I'm happy to be here, and thanks for coming. And we can say we have a standing room only crowd back there, so that's great. great. Dan, you need, you need to. Yeah, okay. 
How you like, can you hear me now? Okay, thank you very much. So for the, uh, the, the role that we're asking for your vote about is a federal role. So I'll talk about the biggest issue uh, that I'd be assigned if I want to go back to Washington. That would be to eliminate the, the annual budget deficit. That's the destructor back there, a destroyer. And that's what I w it's the first item that I want to do is, is balance the budget. The, uh, the overspending back there by the current administration, so-called progressives and liberals back there, have it at $16 trillion. I can't count. I don't think most of us could envision that amount of money. But it's real dollars in, in current debt that uh, the students will have to pay with, students in the audience, and maybe even your children will have to deal with it. And what this is going to do, it's going to intrude on our ability to, to cover all social programs and discretionary monies. Uh, and I also recognize that the rec government can play a role, but it's not the only solution for our, for our issues today. I think the main thing is for individuals to take personal responsibility, especially for the students at your age. Um, and you should, and, and along the line of education, for example, take, uh, advoc I would advocate for more state and local control over plans and programs. And uh, be believing that the, the local uh, delivery of government service is really the best delivery. So I would advocate that. I'd support anything California along, goes along those lines. Um, as for the private sector, I'm a private sector guy, 26 years running a company, a real company. Um, let the citizens uh, pro problem, solve, uh, problem solve, change, the, uh, change the, the direction of this country. Uh, and, the, and no more government heavy mandates. We're not a top-down society. I'm a bottom-up guy. Uh, so for more individual choice, more freedom to succeed on your terms, not mine, right? We want to give you freedom. Make the choices in life and find the need and fill it. The future is in your hands. Thank you. Thank you. The second question, and Mr. Roberts, you'll get uh, to answer this one. Cap and trade of carbon emissions let me back up. You'll get to answer this one first, and then. Excuse me. I, I, I was saying you'll get to answer this one, but you both get to answer. But you get to go first. Thank you. <laughs> Just to clarify, cap and trade of carbon emissions was introduced by Republicans over a decade ago as a market-driven solution to the climate crisis. It is now being rolled out in California. As a congressman, would you vote for or against a national cap and trade or similar program? Explain why. How else would you address climate change? The, uh, the House has already defeated that. It didn't go very far at a federal level. I think it's unfortunate the state uh, it has uh, adopted an AB uh, 32. The additional tax on California businesses is probably $500 million to a $1 billion, which is going to make it on producers, and it's going to make us less uh, competitive. And we're in a global economy. We have states around us, and Canada, of course, can provides uh, products as well. So if we go alone on this, which apparently we're now, we're going to be alone on this, uh, it's going to make California less competitive versus other states, including our neighbors. We will be an island unto ourselves. Other states and nations will have a competitive advantage over us because it's going to raise the cost of business. Um, the neighboring states, there was a consortium formed when this was proposed, but those, those uh, consortium members have evaporated. They've re looked at it carefully, and they have abandoned it. Uh, and honestly, the unions are now opposed to it because they see what's going to happen to jobs. I, my campaign is based on jobs. There's a trade-off between job creation and radical environmentalism. My campaign is about common sense approaches, not adverse mandates. We should look to cleaner means of production and the private, and I agree with that, and the private sector solutions are being sought to recapture carbon uh, byproducts and, uh, and, and also we're talking about nuclear energy. The spent, that's a big issue against nucle using nuclear energy right now, uh, and I'm for it, is that the uh, rods can be reprocessed just like they do in France. And uh, over 90% of their energy in France is very low cost and renewable clean nuclear energy. So we have uh, generally, I would say, engineering solutions to engineering problems. Um, and so it's not enough, it's not enough to do nothing, but it's, n it's too much to panic and say the sky is falling. Uh, so, and doing nothing is not a solution. The private sector, if, if allowed, will provide answers to these issues. Thank you. Well, I, I want to start by, by maybe explaining to those who aren't policy wonks, uh, conversant in cap and trade, kind of what it does. 
Uh, it is indeed, as the question uh, points out, a, a Republican market-based idea that's been around for a number of years. It's been used uh, in some cases successfully uh, to uh, limit uh, emissions of things like NOx and SOx on the East Coast. It's been used in some cases in ways that were not effective. And it's basically a way of taking certain types of industries that pollute and setting a cap on the amount that they're allowed to pollute and then forcing them to buy credits for any pollution emissions above that cap. The theory is that that will force industries to invest in the most uh, immediate and efficient ways to make those uh, improvements. And uh, it's something that uh, Democrats and others kind of adopted as part of California's AB 32. Uh, and I, it had some appeal because it is a way, it is one way of putting, beginning to put a price on carbon when we talk about greenhouse gas emissions. We do need to put a price on carbon. That inevitably is going to be part of the solution to tackling global warming. Cap and trade is not my first choice for how to get there. Uh, I would much prefer some kind of a uniform carbon tax. Uh, but the question asks me, would I vote for it? Uh, and I guess the, the, the answer is, uh, if it were part of a package and that was the best that I could do, yeah, it's, it's better than nothing because it's beginning to put a price on carbon. Here in California, I'm pleased by the fact that cap and trade is actually a very small part of our Global Warming Solutions Act implementation plan. It's only, I think, around 15 percent of the emissions that we're going to get. There are all sorts of other strategies and plans that are going to help us get to our longer term goal. But cap and trade uh, is a market-based idea. It used to make sense to Republicans, but then again, so did things like uh, disclosure of campaign finances. And then once we implement them, they move the goalpost on us. So. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next question. Health care, through a range of insurance choices, similar to the recently enacted Affordable Care Act, was first suggested as a market-driven way to reduce the economic burden of health care on businesses and to provide equitable coverage. In Congress, will you uphold the Affordable Health Care Act and or how else would you improve access to affordability of health care for all Americans? What linkages do you see between health and the environment? Mr. Huffman, you go first. Well, this is a, another one where the goalposts seem to have moved. A few years back, um, it was our friends in, in the GOP that thought it was a good idea to have an individual mandate and to bring everyone under the umbrella of private insurance. And a guy named Mitt Romney led the charge and put that model in place in Massachusetts. Uh, now they call it a massive government takeover of health care. Um, because it's actually happening at the federal level. So uh, it's interesting. Sometimes I feel like our friends on the right wing just don't want government to succeed in anything. Uh, and even when their ideas find their way into government policies, they just change their mind and decide they're against them. Uh, I think the Affordable Care Act is an important incremental step towards the kind of health care system that I would like to see in this country. I personally think we need universal national health insurance, uh, Medicare for all, single, single payer. Uh, whatever you choose to call it. Uh, but I will tell you, having uh, a system such as we do now with Obamacare, where it, at least almost everyone is going to have health insurance, and at least there are some reforms to say the private sector, uh, the tender mercies of the private sector can no longer pull your insurance coverage if you have a, a lifetime cap that you've hit because you got really sick, or if you filled out a form and they claim that you, uh, you left something out in your original application, or if you have a pre-existing condition and you lose your job, uh, you need to get coverage under all these reforms. We're not going to go backward, and that's really the fundamental difference I think you see on the health care issue, perhaps between my opponent and me. I want to defend where we are today and keep moving forward towards a modern 21st century health care system in this country. And I think the alternative vision uh, is to go back to the way it was a few years ago without these reforms. The, uh, the reality is that uh, you know, Obamacare is now recognized as the law of the land after having been modified by the Supreme Court. So the fact of the matter is, however I stood, it's the law of the land, so we've got to deal with it. The question is, um, Who's going to monitor the financial? I'm a financial guy, 40 years in finance, 26 running my own small firm. So who's going to monitor the uh, financial I impacts on the citizens and on the state? Uh, and one important uh, change that my opponent didn't mention is that the states, the Supreme Court modified the terms of the bill saying the states can opt out of the mandate to get involved with their Medicare 
uh, money uh, obligations, and this state has not yet, but they just might decide that. I'm not, I'm not sure how that's going to pencil out. But other, ba other states have opted out of it because of the huge costs. Uh, now, in terms of uh, uh, California has a structural budget imbalance through the years uh, that my opponent has considerably voted in favor of as proposed. So I'm not sure that Obamacare works financially for California, although he probably supported it. And other states, as I say, are declining this federal plan. A better way to go is for, to allow individuals to buy their own coverage across state lines, just as now we can buy purchase, we can purchase auto coverage, for example, from Texas. Uh, you get the coverage that you want at the at the price you want to pay, and um, and coverage is also then the coverage is portable. This is a former Republican initiative, and so I I I, I understand it. And then so as g individuals go from job to job, they can take their coverage with them. And then probably use a, Gingrich had a health uh, care managed account where you get a write-off for contributions into it to handle the money end of it. Uh, and I think that works, so it, it, to ease the cost. Uh, as regarding the environment on uh, health, and uh, I call for common sense solutions, and uh, there are court remedies, uh, private remedies for polluters. Thank you. Our fourth question. Education is the foundation of an informed electorate, a viable 21st century economy, and widespread individual opportunity. What specific legislative steps and public investments would you propose to promote education, and especially to promote the scientific knowledge that underpins our economic and environmental future? Mr. Roberts, do you have yes. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, first of all, I'll begin with an idea. Education is really a state's issue. It's not a federal issue. It's not in the Constitution. So we start there. We say also that uh, for myself, I'm a product of the public education high school college system. I went to Lowell High School in San Francisco State College. But when I went to school, K-12, the educational programs, for the most part, were created and delivered and controlled by the local school boards, which isn't so much the case now with federal and state heavy hands on the product. Uh, and recognizing, they, they seem to think that one size fits all. I don't believe in that. And it leaves little that it kind of uh, search for the top, the Obama plan, leaves little room for individual growth. So I believe in I'm about a freedom, free choice uh, campaign here. So I'd advocate for more local control of schools. I call for the federal government to get out of educational funding, leave the money in California, use it here. The, the federal education, I would eliminate that department. Uh, education is no better 30 years later than it was before Jimmy Carter introduced it. I but however, I call for this. I support, a, um, I support a, a, a fresh look at how education and local school boards are funded in California. They have to, they have to fix this because um, they, ha they have problems with even core curriculum here. Uh, for example, in... Um, and they need to revisit Serrano Priest, the, the court, Supreme Court decision that called for equal funding, right? Which is a real problem. I think the local citizens, you would invest the local citizen more in education if they could do more on the curriculum. The buildings are handled by the state under bond issues, but the money for the kids uh, should come from a local funding. They need to revisit that. Reed School District, where I live and raise three children, they're actually capped out on Serrano Priest right now. So if we have growth, of, of students, we get no more money for the curriculum, which is really a it's bad public policy. Uh, so they need a better funding mechanism in California, and which would allow for, if they could fix it, it'd allow for more science labs as part of the core curriculum, and it'll better prepare the kids for their technical needs for their uh, whatever field of endeavor. Thank you. Well, I, I strongly believe that at all levels, uh, state, federal, and local, we need to support education much more than we are doing right now. So the federal role, uh, since we're here in a congressional debate, uh, has typically been setting some very minimal standards that have to be met, recognizing that education is largely a, a matter of state uh, and local policy choices. So for example, when some states decided they thought it was a good idea to have segregation. The federal government said, no, you can't do that. Uh, the federal government has also set standards such as the IDEA, which says that students with disabilities and special needs have to be provided a meaningful uh, education. That's a federal mandate. Uh, what the federal government needs to do, in addition to continuing to setting 
uh, thoughtful minimum standards is, is to put some dollars behind some of these things. Special education is a mandate I strongly support, but it's never gotten anywhere close to the kind of federal dollars uh, to, to make it more effective that it needs. So uh, that is one thing that we could do right away uh, that would have immediate benefit to school districts all over uh, the country, uh, especially small districts that struggle with the sometimes uh, very expensive uh, challenge of providing that education for, for kids with disabilities. Um, the critical need that we face right now uh, as a country is the need to compete economically in a global economy where science, technology, engineering, and math are becoming a premium. If we're going to have the most productive workforce in the world, we're going to have to dramatically increase our investment in those technical areas. And we can't just leave that to uh, a patchwork of standards around this country. I think it's something that the federal government needs to step up to even more uh, and actually put some money behind it. Um, but with that said, so I am going to be supporting uh, a federal framework for education. It, it needs to be one that is less punitive and rigid than the No Child Left Behind framework that we've seen uh, for the past decade plus from the Bush administration. It needs to recognize that each school district inherits different types of kids with different challenges and it needs to reward growth and innovation rather than set arbitrary standards and then punish school districts that don't meet them. Thank you. Fifth question. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that money is speech and corporations are persons. In light of the growing gap between the rich and ordinary citizens and in the face of unlimited money and corporate influence flowing into politics, how do we create a sustainable democracy in which all people have a voice and an incentive to participate? Please address this question to the students here tonight who represent the, our future as a nation. Mm -hmm. And once again, two minutes, and uh, Mr. Huffman, you begin. Yeah, it's a great question because uh, the, the money in politics is out of control. Frankly, it's been out of control for a long time. Uh, but with the advent of Citizens United, it, it's sort of reached new and absurd levels. Um, I think the only way we're going to fix it, uh, we, and we can continue working on disclosure. Again, this is one of these things that used to be the GOP answer to campaign finance reform. They said, well, let's just have disclosure and transparency. Well, now that when we try to move forward with something like the Disclose Act at both the federal and the state level, they're against it. I co-authored the California Disclose Act, and we couldn't get the Republican votes needed to move it forward. Why? Because with the Citizens United ruling, the deck is so incredibly stacked in favor of those who carry the water for big business and big industry, why would they want to vote for any change? The system's working great for them right now. So unfortunately, uh, the Republicans have kind of become the party of no on addressing this issue in any way, uh, even taking their old idea of disclosure and trying to move it forward. The only way we're going to fix this, just cutting right to the chase, is a constitutional amendment. Um, some of you folks in this room may live long enough to see a new Supreme Court. Uh, Supreme Court justices hang around for a long time, I'm, I'm here to tell you. Um, and maybe a, a new enlightened Supreme Court would revisit some of these rulings, but that's, I think that's unlikely within any kind of an acceptable time frame. The best approach is to get a constitutional amendment going. We've done it less than 30 times in the history of our country, uh, but I think the, the uh, excesses that we're seeing in this election cycle might just lay the foundation and might provide the motivation for us to rise up and, and pull together and, and make this happen. It would clarify that the First Amendment is, is a great, wonderful, important thing, but it doesn't give corporate personhood rights uh, to non-people. It doesn't allow uh, unlimited political spending in the name of free speech by entities that aren't people. And, and it's easy enough to craft that in a way that doesn't do violence uh, to the First Amendment. So that's what I support as a solution. Please hold your applause. Yeah, granted, uh, money is speech, especially since uh, Citizens United. There's no getting around the fact that since uh, Democracy, getting out the message, is, is, an, is getting expenses, more expensive, especially in the second district. So thanks for forums such as like this. Uh, excellent way to hear from the candidates. But beyond these forums, money is speech for all practical purposes. My opponent, who can be considered the serving 
office holder or candidate, has taken monies from those who are regulated businesses, i.e. bankers, insurance companies, oil and gas companies, utilities and unions, on and on. What, to what, uh, is, what is he owed to these entities? What strings are attached? What promises has he made to attract these vast contributions? Most professional politicians follow this path, whereas in my case, 99% of my contributions come from the individuals within the district, individuals, I say, and no contributions from any corporates or unions. My approach is to gain a mandate from the voters. Citizens will be my endorsers, and then, I and o and then my obligation is to them and only them. With California broken and going in the wrong direction under my opponent's stewardship, the voters should ask this question. Does my opponent deserve a promotion? You have to answer that for yourself. Thank you. All right, so um, now we're to the closing statements and we have added uh, a little section here. So you each get two minutes for a closing statement and because of the coin toss, uh, I understand that you, Mr. Huffman, will go first. Okay. Well, thanks again uh, for this forum, and I will just close by returning to the theme of this forum, which is sustainability. And uh, if you're interested in a candidate that uh, cares deeply about this, that has actually dedicated a, a significant amount of his personal and professional life uh, to sustainability in its various forms, uh, I hope I will have your vote in this election. I'm kind of unique as a legislator because I... I uh, came to politics because of my passion for the environment. A lot of people do it the other way around. Uh, they're interested in politics and they realize as they're trying to climb the political ladder, well, I guess I better find a way to say something about the environment. Uh, I was an attorney for uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council, a large national environmental organization working on all sorts of interesting uh, issues uh, before I ran for the assembly and I've stayed very true to those core environmental values. I have co-chaired the Legislative Environmental Caucus for the last four years. I've chaired environmental committees. You'd, you'd have a hard time finding a legislator in Sacramento that's passed more uh, environmental bills, uh, much less quality and impactful uh, environmental bills. And that has uh, been recognized with awards that I've been honored to receive from just about every major environmental organization in the state, uh, the highest awards given by Audubon California and Sierra Club and Planning Conservation League and Product Stewardship Council, and we could go on for a while. It's been a good run. I want to take that same passion uh, about our planet, about our future, about the environment, and take it to the federal level. Uh, I know that it's going to be a different forum. I'm not going to be able to legislate, perhaps, as aggressively and prolifically as I've been able to do in Sacramento, but I still think there's a lot we can do. When I was a kid, uh, it, it was pretty bleak. We had a river in Ohio that caught on fire. Uh, the Great Lakes were declared dead. People thought that the bald eagle was going to go extinct. Uh, and then all of a sudden, in a short period of time, we had the first Earth Day. And there was this amazing national awareness that formed. And within a few short years, we passed all of these wonderful uh, environmental laws that have made a huge difference, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and so on. Uh, it seems overwhelming right now, but we can do this. And I think the discussion that we've started here tonight uh, is a good start. So thanks very much. Yeah, in closing, uh, once again, I want to thanks for having this. It's very important to get the message out. Think of me, though, as um, although I'm, I'm carrying the Republican flag, I'm very much an independent reformer my whole life. Uh, and, and so I'm asking my, my voters, the voters, to consider my campaign in a, in a post-partisan manner. So regardless of party, think of who brings the most skills. Uh, and that's primarily because we have an imbalance. Unfortunately, we have an imbalance of registrations in California, in this district, and in this county. So think about what that means. It's a you know, one-party rule. Um, choosing, I think, I would hope that you choose the candidate who brings the, the best set of professional experiences and values for this important office, the federal office. I have 40 years in finance, so I can bring in-depth experience to the, this financial crisis. My prior military uh, duties, I was the only uh, veteran of the 12 who ran in the primary, and I still am the only veteran running, uh, would bring uh, gravitas to the issue um, of war and peace. My 30 years of nonprofit, continuous nonprofit work, uh, brings me the, the ability, as required in nonprofits, to uh, draw consensus, to problem solve. 
My past experience with the Marin Local and Planning and Regional Planning as president of the Strawberry Area Community Council forged consensus leading to the largest inhabited area annexation in Marin County history. I am tested and proven common sense problem solver. Uh, with your vote and your mandate, I bring actual experience to the House of Representatives to right this ship which is badly broken. I would be honored to have your vote. Thank you. Um, so before we uh, thank our candidates, I uh, want to thank you. I, I have really enjoyed this. I really want to thank you both uh, for letting me be your moderator. And You're I want better than Jim Lair. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, and I want to invite uh, you all to check out the Climate Protection Campaign online, climateprotection.org. Uh, we feel akin to you, and uh, we would love to, you know, continue the affiliation. So now let us applaud and thank our candidates. knowledge and go and vote and vote thoughtfully and all you young people who have friends who are 18 please make sure they register please make sure that everyone has an opportunity to vote as we've seen in our country it's a very uh, fragile right um, I'd also like to remind you that uh, this evening will be broadcast on Marin TV thanks to CMCM Community Media Center of Marin so please check the web and you will find the schedule or check your Comcast ch uh, cable channel. Uh, thank you to Next Key Center for very nice food, very nice service. <laughs> and two more things. Outside you'll find email uh, sign-up forms so that you can stay informed about what we are doing in the sustainability community and that means environment, economy, and equity. And please stay in touch with us. We'd like to stay in touch with you. Your email is safe with us. Uh, and the evening's not over because these two gentlemen have agreed to stay for another 15 minutes or so to entertain direct questions from you. And I hope that you'll all take advantage of it. Thanks to Sustainable San Rafael. Thank you. Thanks to all of you.